Final Fantasy IV is an incredibly important game. It may have been overshadowed by its successors over the years, but no matter what comes after, I'll always have an incredible amount of respect and admiration for it. I won't lie, nostalgia definitely plays a factor here. This was one of the first RPGs I can remember even seeing, let alone playing. I don't think that nostalgia is unfounded though, it truly is a spectacular game. I think I've made my thoughts on it clear enough, between this and 4's inclusion in the JRPG video, so I'll stop talking about my perspective. But let's think about Final Fantasy IV's position in the greater Square Enix library. By a mixture of circumstance and reverence, Final Fantasy IV had managed to remain in the greater conversation of excellent RPGs for a time by way of its absolutely staggering amount of ports. Out of all the Final Fantasy games, 4 has received the most ports, beating out the original Final Fantasy and even Final Fantasy VII. Some of these ports went above and beyond too, the PlayStation Portable version featuring significantly higher res sprites and backgrounds, and the DS version, as well as the mobile and Steam versions, being a full-blown 3D remake in line with the fidelity possible on the console. Now, it's been a while since I've played this version myself, but general reception from the time and now seems to agree that this version is quite good, if not a lot harder than the original release. Why give Final Fantasy IV this embarrassment of ports is a question I found myself asking a lot over these past months. To say it's because Final Fantasy IV is the most well-revered entry in the series would be a lie, when there's entries like 6, 7, or hell even 5 that people still discuss and play to this day that would probably be put above 4 on a scale of quality. At one point, I thought it was because it truly is a fan favorite for Japanese gamers, but that doesn't seem to be the case, at least nowadays. Although, the fact that Final Fantasy IV's theme of love is taught in some Japanese schools' musical curriculum may suggest that there was a stretch of time where it was the king of the series. I believe the reason we've gotten so many ports over the years is a mixture of the high quality of the game as well as being in the right place at the right time. IV started out as a Super Nintendo game, a Super Nintendo game that launched fairly early into the system's life cycle. As a result, while it's certainly more colorful and impressive than its NES predecessors, it can't hold a candle to later Square JRPGs, including Final Fantasy VI. You don't need a lot of power in your system to play a game like Final Fantasy IV, whereas something like VI might have caused some issues on a system like the Wonderswan. Final Fantasy V has graphics closer to IV than VI, so it could have also been a ripe target for being ported to any electronic with a screen, and it certainly did receive some, but not as many. Why is that? I think the answer is obvious. It didn't get localized to the states until several years after its release. The first time most westerners had a chance to play Final Fantasy V was when it was re-released on the PlayStation in 1999. IV had an 8 year head start to be ingrained in the mind of western gamers, and to this day, while V definitely has its fans, it didn't have the same impact IV did. So whether due to the circumstances of its release, the quality of the game itself, or some mixture of the two, Final Fantasy IV managed to live on in many RPG players' hearts as a classic. So, I guess, it was inevitable then, that someone would come up with the bright idea of making a sequel. Sequels are common practice in games, but for a long time, Final Fantasy was one of those series that never followed up on a story. But times change, and I'm sure the release of Final Fantasy X-2 had a role in making this idea more palatable. Hot off the heels of the successful DS remake and just in time for the 20th anniversary of Final Fantasy, Matrix Software approached Square Enix with the idea of a sequel to the original game. A sequel that could be made via a fast turnaround while the remake was still in the zeitgeist. As was trendy at the time, an episodic format was used, each telling a different perspective of the greater narrative through the lens of a part of Final Fantasy IV's large ensemble cast. While originally a mobile phone release, it would receive a much wider release when it came out on the Wii's then-fledgling WiiWare service as a download-only title. 17 years later, in both our world and the world of Final Fantasy IV, the continuation of Cecil, Kane, Rosa, Rydia, and Edge's story would begin known as Final Fantasy IV The After Years. It is one of the worst JRPGs I have ever played. While not as staggering of a selection compared to its predecessor, Final Fantasy IV The After Years does have its fair share of different releases. I'll mention the original mobile phone release just for the sake of completeness, but that version only released in Japan and seems to be inferior in every way to the WiiWare release. 
This was the original release of the game to the Western audience. As stated earlier, it had an episodic format, so you paid 10 bucks for the base game and then a couple more bucks for each subsequent story, totaling up to $32. 30 bucks doesn't seem like a lot, and I guess it really isn't, but something about it rubs me the wrong way. The asking price for the base game was in line with most other high-shelf WiiWare and Virtual Console games, but when starting up the game for the first time, it becomes clear that to get the complete story, you'll need to pay triple the price. It's not only sneaky, but also, as I'll discuss, a gamble whether or not the quality of the episode you're about to buy is worth the price of four sheets hot dogs. This version of the game also tries to emulate the original look of the SNES game, which I commend since I'm a fan of that look. But there's a bunch of small issues with it that bothers me, like the blurriness of the character sprites. I'll admit, there are a marked improvement over the originals and go for a look more inspired by Final Fantasy VI. However, also like Final Fantasy VI, the battle sprites and overworld sprites of the characters are one and the same. Now, I'm sure this is fine for some, but I don't think these sprites come close to the amount of detail featured in the battle sprites of the original Final Fantasy IV. In fact, I think these sprites would have worked better in the after years because of the Wii's higher resolution and widescreen support. There's a lot of space on these battle screens, and it makes the character sprites look puny by comparison. They're not the only things that look puny though, that goes for the enemies as well. Look at all this negative space on the battle screen. I'm hesitant to give them too much flack for this though, since higher res sprites would have likely ballooned the file size above the pathetic 44 megabyte limit Nintendo enforced on WiiWare titles. I will give them flack for this though. Why does the background just stop when it's under the battle menu? This isn't like the SNES game, I can see it getting cut off now, it looks terrible. Everything from the faux mode 7, to the font, to the MIDI renditions of the original soundtrack just feels cheap in this version. And yet, I don't know if I can consider this version to be the worst. I think that accolade goes to the version available on iOS, Android, and the Steam Store. Sure, it has the graphics seen in the DS Remake, which I think are an improvement to the cheap look of the WiiWare release, although the UI feels very mobile phone-like. But it has a huge issue, one that wouldn't be apparent to anyone who's played this until it's far too late. That problem being the completely gutted final dungeon in this version. Without spoiling anything, let's just say that there are a lot of unique boss fights in the final dungeon of the After Years. Bosses that didn't have models that could be pilfered from 4DS. So instead, I guess they decided that they weren't worth the effort and removed them wholesale. So don't get the 3D release. It doesn't even have voice acting like 4DS did. So despite it being the most readily available version, it's probably the worst. That just leaves us with one more port, and it's probably the best of them all. Final Fantasy IV The Complete Collection released on the Sony PlayStation Portable in 2011, and was a package containing the original FF4, the After Years, and a new story tying the two games together. This game is still in 2D, but everything is in a significantly higher resolution. Personally, I think the character sprites look a little too tall, but I'm aware that's a personal gripe. This version of FF4 looks beautiful. This version also retains the layout of the final dungeon, so it has feature parity with the original release, unlike the PC version. Without a shadow of a doubt, this is the definitive version of Final Fantasy IV The After Years. One problem, it's only on the PSP. Thankfully, UMDs of this game are far from expensive, so if you wanted to pick this game up on original hardware, you could fairly easily, assuming you can find a PSP that hasn't had its battery activate the kill switch and leak into the internals. However, you shouldn't need to worry about that since there's another way to play the complete collection legitimately. The PlayStation Vita features full backwards compatibility with the PSP, albeit digitally. It's $15 in the Vita store, so I recommend picking this up sooner rather than later. In the time it's taken me to complete this video, Sony has both announced they were killing PS3, Vita, and PSP storefronts only to backpedal on the decision two weeks later. It's only a matter of time before they actually follow through and shut down these storefronts, so regardless of the good news, don't delay. And speaking of delaying, let's not wait any longer.
I imagine there was a problem at Matrix Software when approaching the game design of the After Years. The once novel and innovative active time battle system had been showing its age for quite some time, to the point that the mainline Final Fantasies hadn't used it in over seven years. But it's not like they could just completely change the gameplay to a direct sequel to Final Fantasy IV. What they decided to do was keep the chassis the same, but add a couple of mechanics on top of it. The first of which being the moon phase system. Depending on which of the four phases of the moon are active, a different buff and debuff will be applied to both the player and enemies. For example, when the moon is full, black magic power will be increased, while physical attacks are weakened. White magic and skills can also be affected by the moon. There are also certain enemies that can only appear during certain moon phases, but I never noticed this while playing. I mostly don't mind the moon phases, but I definitely have some critiques to levy towards it. For one, the skill buff is incredibly nebulous and arbitrary. Kane's jump skill is buffed by the effect, but Yang's kick and Edge's throw skills aren't. Yang's kick is considered a physical attack, which I suppose it is, but when compared to other skills that are similar, it, it just feels inconsistent. Some skills don't get affected from any of the moon phases. Rydia's summon skill should be buffed by the skill phase, or at least the black magic phase, but it interacts with neither. Maybe this was meant to be its appeal, but it just makes me think the moon phases weren't completely thought out. There's also the matter of enemies receiving the buffs and nerfs. One thing I will give this system is, in theory, it allows you to manipulate the phase if you know what kinds of enemies are incoming. A lot of mages rest in a tent until the waning phase and those mages won't be able to hurt you much. Unfortunately though, a lot of the time there's a diversity in the enemy variety, so while the hypothetical mages might be weakened, any physical fighters will hit like a truck. It's give and take, but overall I don't hate this mechanic. The second major addition are the bands. In an additional battle menu, you can have two or more characters abscond their turns to use a special attack. What the attack is depends on what characters you're having interact and what moves they use when they initiate the band. Usually it's just an extra powerful attack, but it can be other useful moves like healing or a haste effect. These bands cost MP to use, so you usually can't spam them indefinitely. This means that every character will have at least some MP, but characters that don't specialize in magic won't be able to use bands as much as those who do because of this. There's a load of different combinations you can discover that will create unique bands, the amount is quite staggering. And since there's a handful that are given to you throughout the adventure, you'll never be without at least one. That said, a majority have to be discovered on your own through experimentation. I'm all for finding things out on your own, but there's way too many combinations of characters and variations in what moves those characters can use to find a majority of these bands on your own. And since even attempting a band in battle eats up a significant amount of time, you should probably search for bands in an encounter with low stakes, lest you die trying to find out the bands you have access to. I recommend just looking up what bands are in the game and seeing which ones you can use with your party layout. There are usually some really good ones out there, just be aware that you only get access to a majority of them in the final stretch of the game. The reason for that is thanks to the episodic format, the large ensemble cast is spread thin throughout the many different episodes following a specific character and their journey. This is quite the departure from the linear storytelling of Final Fantasy IV. If anything, much like the character sprites, it has more in common with Final Fantasy VI. Although, according to Takashi Tokita, this format was primarily inspired by the cult RPG Live Alive. I'll refrain from discussing the consequences of the episodic format to the story for now, I don't want to get too ahead of myself. But the game design of the After Years is completely kneecapped, thanks in no small part to this format. To explain why, I have to first explain why I even like these kinds of games, or more specifically, why I like Final Fantasy IV. If you watched the JRPG video, you know why, but I'll cover it once more. I like JRPGs because of the clear progression shown to the player. Through constant battles, you're given experience points and or gold. The EXP levels up your characters, increasing their stats like attack and defense. Gold can be used to buy useful items that let your characters survive in the field longer, or equipment that further increases their power. There's really nothing quite like breaking triple damage numbers or finally learning Meteor in games like FF4. So what's the problem? The After Years does all these things, right? Yes, it does. In fact, it does it too much. Since every episode stars a different group of characters, you have to start from square one almost a dozen times. 
It's like a tease. By the time you finally start to see the fruits of your labors with a group of characters, the episode is over and you have to start from scratch with a new group. Progression feels stilted, to say the least. Another thing that bugs me is the amount of characters given to you in each story. Something that was featured in Final Fantasy IV that never got replicated in future entries was the total party size. FF4 required you to juggle 5 characters at its maximum. Thanks to this, coupled with ATB, battles are wonderfully chaotic. There's almost always something to do. So what, does After Years backstep the 4 party members or something? No, the, the maximum is still 5, but you'll never control that many characters until the endgame. A majority of episodes put you in control of 2 party members on average. Sometimes you get a few more, sometimes you get as few as- <sighs> As few as one party member. Final Fantasy IV had variants in its party members, but it knew to keep those moments brief. After a couple of hours in 4, you'll have a completely full party, whereas depending on the story in the after years, you'll be lucky to have 4 party members. The game definitely understands this to be a problem, since there are occasions where you'll fight al- <laughs> Sorry. Occasions where you're given literal generics to fight alongside you. This is unbelievably lame. I get that they can't exactly give you a named character when they're off doing something else at the same time in the story, but maybe that should have told them that this episodic story format was a bad idea. Another reason why a larger party is better is insurance. When you only have two party members at your disposal and one of them is, say, a squishy black mage, exploration is one nasty random encounter away from disaster. Okay, let's talk about them. Random encounters. They're, at best, tolerated, and at worst, reviled. Am I gonna say I like random encounters? No, no, I wouldn't say I like them, but I definitely don't hate it when they're included in a game. I'd say I fall in the former camp. I tolerate them. While I won't deny that there are definitely some people who outright detest random encounters on a conceptual level, I think a fair amount of its critics don't dislike random encounters themselves, rather, they dislike the frequency of random encounters. I think Final Fantasy IV has a reasonable random encounter rate. You can usually progress through a decent amount of tiles in a dungeon before being forced into a battle. If only this was one of the many facets of IV borrowed for the design of the After Years. The encounter rate on display in this game is some of the worst I've ever seen. Being forced into battles five steps apart for long stretches of time is the standard. Not to mention, the amount of surprise encounters and back attacks felt much higher than in other games with that feature. Although, I understand that could just be confirmation bias. What I want to know is why the random encounter rate is so high. I think I have an answer, but be warned, it's somewhat layered and fairly uncharitable. That said, this game isn't exactly easy to be charitable towards. Anyway, I, I think the reason for the high encounter rate is to pad out the runtime. Each episode is about 2-3 to three hours of content if you're trying to complete the story without going through any sort of optional side quests or grinding. If the random encounter rate was slashed at half the amount it is now, each episode, barring the base game and the final chapter, would probably have a half hour or so cut. Which doesn't seem like a lot at first, but when you're selling these pieces separately for four or so dollars each and the content is already three hours max, that's not an insignificant chunk of time. Like I said before though, I, I think there's layers to this. The high encounter rate might have also have been a band-aid solution to mitigate grinding another dreaded trope of the JRPG genre. If this is the case, then I can safely say that they completely failed, because the After Years features more than its fair share of grinding, despite being a sequel to a game that hardly ever asked you to resort to that. Not every party composition is created equal, after all. In Palom's Story, for example, you really do need to indulge in a little bit of grinding to make any sort of meaningful progress since for the entirety of the episode, you're controlling Palom and newcomer Lenora, and nobody else. Both of these characters are spellcasters, and Lenora isn't a particularly great one. For a majority of the episode, she's dead weight unless you grind her levels. Lenora isn't an outlier either, she's the standard. Almost every episode has at least one character that's dead weight. Hell, in the case of Edge's story, there's four. Most of the time, the dead weight characters are unfortunately one of the new ones. I don't really get why they decided to make it like this. These new characters are already fighting an uphill battle to make us like them. 
making them terrible in fights doesn't help in the slightest. The After Years has a gigantic cast of characters that all become available to you in the endgame episode, but since they all retain their levels, armor, and abilities from the end of the episode they came from, you'll end up with an incredibly lopsided selection with some characters reaching level 30, whereas some are festering in the low 20s. It doesn't help that Rydia's group, composed of Edge, Luca, one of the only new characters I like, the Man in Black, and the Summoner herself have a lengthy section of this final episode devoted to them, giving this group, and the group from the first episode, Theodore, Kane, Rosa, and Sid, a significant head start in levels. Then there's Cecil, who finally becomes available to you in the final dungeon. Everyone I've seen play this game picked a final party from this roster. You may call it anecdotal, I call it logical. Sure, it'd be cool to use Palm and Porum, but if you wanted to subject yourself to using them, you'd have to do even more grinding. And trust me, the final episode has enough grinding already. Level 23, level 36, whatever. None of my party members bearing the man in black were ready to tackle the final dungeon when all was said and done. I had to grind for several hours lest I be wiped by the encounters on display in the first damn floor. By the final episode, any amount of goodwill I had towards the game had been taken from me piece by piece with every back attack and surprise encounter I stumbled across. And the story sucks too. Seventeen years after the events of the original Final Fantasy IV, the After Years starts off by following Cecil and Rose's son, Theodore as he begins his rite of passage in becoming a member of the prestigious Baron Red Wings. After this initiation, however, disaster strikes the land, as monsters begin to roam in increasingly high numbers as a second moon appears in the sky. Theodore's airship becomes shipwrecked, leaving him as the only survivor. Theodore then meets up with a man cloaked in purple who wishes to assist him on his trip home to Baron. Meanwhile, at Baron Castle, King Cecil is overwhelmed by the monsters laying siege to it, and finally is defeated by a mysterious girl who has gained the control of the legendary Bahamut. What is happening to the world? What's happened to Cecil? Who is the mysterious hooded man? Find out in Final Fantasy IV The After Years. Or, find out right now. The second moon is a spaceship invading the planet, Cecil is fine but he's under my control, and the hooded man is Kane. I could do that thing you see in some YouTube videos where I painstakingly synopsize the plot and nitpick every little thing I find wrong with it, absolutely ballooning this video's length to a crazy degree. I know some people would love that, but this game has already occupied my time for long enough and I really just want to move on. I'll start with some positives. There aren't many, but I do have some. I think they managed to make some of the characters from Final Fantasy IV grow in the past 17 years in a meaningful way without having them be completely unrecognizable. Edge has cooled down significantly. He's still a little brash at times, but he's grown to be much more cunning. Palum is a full-grown adult now, so his loudmouth and prodigy complex has morphed into a sense of self-assurance, although he's still a bit of an ass. Edward has much more confidence and actually pulls a pretty clever move at one point in the story. I think the standout character, though, is the Man in Black, or should I say, Golbez. Between the Hooded Man, the Mysterious Girl, and the Man in Black, the After Years definitely pulls the hidden identity trope too much, but when it comes to Golbez, I don't really mind. Going through the stories in descending order will have you see the Man in Black a couple of times, but only very briefly. In reality, there's only so many characters this could be, but it's a cool reveal nonetheless when you reach his and Fusoya's story. After going through multiple stories on Earth with little in the way of plot development, it's nice to see the perspective of the Lunarians. Golbez is still racked with guilt over what he did in the original game, and if this game does anything right, it's giving Golbez a redemption arc. It also helps that stat-wise, he's blatantly overpowered compared to the other party members when you receive him. Golbez had a 10 or so level lead on my second highest level party member. He also has pretty great attacking stats, as well as almost every single damaging black magic spell in the game, including the strangely overpowered bio spell. No, seriously. Bio is a second tier, non-elemental damaging spell. It costs 20 MP and will always break 1k damage when the other elemental second tier damaging spells fail to break 700. I don't know why it's so much better, but it is. 
Sure, it falls off eventually, but once any of your mages learn bio, you're set on damage for a pretty good chunk of the game, but I digress. I like what they do with Golbez in this game. His episode, though? Oh god. Alright. Here's why I think the story of the After Years constantly fails. It's not because of the children characters, or the episodic format. It's the constant, unrelenting, rehashing. Time and time again you'll be inundated with events that share a passing resemblance or are straight up copied from Final Fantasy IV. The first few times it happens, it's a little cute, you know, like, oh, haha, <laughs> Kane's going through the mist cave, but this time he's with Cecil's son. It's like poetry, so sort if of they rhyme. But by the time the game made me go through the sealed cave, exactly how it was in the original game, down to the demon wall boss fight, and the crystal prize being taken at the entrance, it wore on my nerves. These reused locations aren't isolated incidents either. I'd say each episode makes you retread through at least one old dungeon. But sometimes, it's even worse. Like Edward's episode, for instance, making you go through the antlion cave and the underground waterway. Three times. I did not stutter. Other characters go through that dungeon too. I never want to fucking see it again. It doesn't even make sense he would have to do that. Are, are you telling me that Edward never had another hovercraft rebuilt? These reused dungeons always have the boss of that dungeon lurking at the end too, even if it makes absolutely no sense. In the final chapter, they drop all pretenses and just start reviving every single old boss that wasn't fought yet with the nebulous power of the crystals. Ooh. The worst example of this, though, happens in the Lunarian's Tale. On their way to stop the mysterious girl from reaching the other sleeping Lunarians, Fusoya and Golbez rush through the entire lunar subterrain. I do mean the entire level, by the way. That, you know, that entire dungeon with just two party members. Very fun. Anyway, as they're climbing down through the subterrain, it keeps cutting back to the crystals on the surface of the moon, and they keep shattering. All the while, I'm wondering what they're trying to set up. Then a thought hits me. But the thought is so insane, I can't even entertain it. But the closer I got to the bottom, the bigger the pit in my stomach got. Until finally. Is nothing sacred? This isn't even a fight you can win, it's just there so Fusoya can teleport Golbez away. It could have been literally anything, but no. They just had to use Zeromus. It doesn't even look good, oh my god, just at least animate the background. One more thing I'd like to touch on is Kane. Kane's resolution in the original game was bittersweet. Like Golbez, he feels guilty for his actions, so he isolated himself on Mount Ordeals until he felt he was worthy to see his friends again. I think it's a great ending to his character, and leaves a lot of room to speculate on when or if he ever ended up seeing them again. The After Years obviously had to address this resolution though, and while I'm not completely upset with it, I do think it's an underwhelming direction for his character. Mainly because it's almost exactly like what Cecil did in FF4. Yep, it's another callback. You surprised? I don't doubt Kane is dedicated, but I still find it extremely ridiculous and kind of funny that Kane spent 17 years on Mount Ordeals doing God knows what. Hell, if it wasn't for the events of the After Years, would he have been there his entire life? What bothers me the most about this similar character arc is when Kane enters the mirror room to fight his evil half, the voice of Cecil's father reaches him. So I guess Cecil's father will talk to anyone who listens in that room. Wouldn't it make more sense for the person to be reaching Kane to be his own father? I know he's not a exactly a well-established character in the original game, but th that's the point. That's an opportunity to expand on something not covered in that game. Nope. Gotta stick to the script. Kane faces his dark half and gets to be a holy dragoon, just like Cecil. Because that's what happens in Final Fantasy IV. Remember Final Fantasy IV, everyone? <laughs>
I feel as though the final episode of the After Years deserves its own part. The Crystals is the largest section of the game. My final time in this specific episode alone could have functioned as its own JRPG with how long it took. Finally, after countless episodes of working through different character storylines, level progress being reset, and constant cliffhangers, this final episode sets out to give the players closure. Of course, they still string you along a little bit. If you wanted the confrontation between the Holy Dragoon Kane and brainwashed King Cecil, or for the rest of the party to discover the identity of the Man in Black, you have to wait even longer since the first section of the storyline involves going all around the world and collecting the summons Rydia lost all the way at the beginning of the game. I'd be more mad at this never-ending game of being strung along, but I was too busy being upset that they made me enter the Lodestone Cavern for a second time. Really though, this isn't that bad, and it's nice that Rydia finally gets her Eidolons back, considering that's the only meaningful thing differentiating her from all the other black mages in the game. Most of them aren't really worth using by this point though, since you'll likely have Bio, and as I said earlier, Bio is like a miracle spell. Once Rydia collects all of the Eidolons, sends a few like Leviathan, Asura, and of course Bahamut, Baron Castle is free to enter, and finally, 75% of the way through the game, Cecil is free from his mind control and he joins the very large party. However, the brainwashing has left him practically lobotomized. His ATB meter moves at a snail's pace and he's essentially dead weight in a fight, so while you could use him, it'll be another dungeon's worth before he's actually useful. This is the longest dungeon so far as well, especially if you count the grind session you'll need to perform if you want to stand a chance of making it through the first couple of floors. Golbez has a pretty low speed stat, so as strong as he is, he can't single-handedly carry a party through the dungeon. At the very least, you're finally able to have an entire party at your disposal, so battles finally reach the chaotic heights of its predecessor. In the home stretch of the game. <sighs> this dungeon also, thankfully, has frequent save points, so you're unlikely to run out of resources. They also occasionally give us some well-deserved character interactions. As neat as large, completely customizable parties are, they come at the cost of characterization. That was the case in Final Fantasy VI, and it's the same here. These vignettes mitigate that somewhat, but they're too little too late. This dungeon also brings out the rest of the remaining Final Fantasy IV bosses that weren't rehashed yet. It's honestly hilarious to think that whoever is responsible for sending the world into chaos thought it was worth it to revive Baigin, of all people. The Four Fiends are revived as well, obviously, but at the very least, Golbez and the Four Fiends get some characterization. It's nice to see that there's a mutual respect and admiration between them. There's only so many bosses for this game to reuse though, and once they run out, the fight against Dark Knight Cecil begins. This fight is actually more of a puzzle than anything. It requires you to have Cecil and Golbez in your party. If you don't, you'll just get a game over. There's more to it though. Rosa and Theodore should be in your party as well. If you only bring Cecil and Golbez to the fight, then Golbez will attempt to make up for his past misdeeds and sacrifice himself. He will die and be permanently removed from the party. Golbez is probably still your best character, and the game will try to make sure you can never use him again unless you use a super specific party dynamic. I believe the idea they were going for was trading Golbez for Cecil in a party composition. I'm usually one of the first people to defend when games attempt to shake up the status quo, but this is no Eris moment. Not to mention, Golbez kind of has unfinished business back on the moon with Fusoya being stuck to handle Zeramis by himself. Golbez dying isn't an emotional gut punch, it's narratively unsatisfying and a kneecap to any sane person's party composition. And the fact that there's a way to ensure he doesn't die tells me that the developers agreed to an extent, or at the very least got cold feet when deciding to kill Golbez off. This final section of the game requires all of the help you can get, so I don't feel bad about looking up a guide on how to save Golbez before the fact. And yet, there's another dungeon that must be completed. The final hours of the After Years are essentially a dungeon crawler, which I think completely misses the point of what makes RPGs like Final Fantasy enjoyable. The pacing has long since been destroyed. The inhale of exploring dungeons and fighting monsters hasn't been accompanied by the exhale of visiting towns and buying armor for hours now, and it's not coming anytime soon. And unless you think grinding is some sort of decompression exercise, personally, I don't. And I think it's insane that there's a jump in difficulty for this final dungeon when it already took me hours of grinding to keep up with enemies I was fighting 20 minutes ago. Good thing I didn't let the game take Golbez away from me.
But if I can give this final dungeon anything, anything at all, it's the boss fights. This is the dungeon I was talking about way back at the beginning of the video that got gutted in the 3D release. The reason for that is because the bosses on display here are all repurposed bosses from earlier Final Fantasy games, from the original Fiends to the Phantom Train. This is just as blatant as the rehashing in the rest of the game, but I won't lie, uh, I like it here. At the very least, they're not from Final Fantasy IV, and it's fun to see the characters from IV react to bosses like Gilgamesh and Ultras. It's also funny to think that what's happening to the world of Final Fantasy IV has already been done in other games' worlds. Something that would make it better is if they adapted the boss music from their respective games. The final dungeon is a boss rush, but at least it's a somewhat cool boss rush. When the finale finally arrives, it's almost unbelievable. The game has been dragging its heels for a while now, and the Mysterious Girl's theme, a theme I used to think was quite good, had long since been overplayed by this point. She's been battled so many times now that it's almost hard to believe that this will be her love. It feels like they accidentally forgot a step in the plot, because suddenly we discover that these mysterious girls are called Maynads. Nothing really changed in between the Bahamut fight and now, so why do we get to know their names? Regardless of how clumsily it's done, we finally get an answer for what's happening throughout the entire game. As it turns out, the crystals were devices sent by an extremely advanced civilization. These crystals were meant to function as a Rosetta Stone of sorts, helping planets advance to a level of progress similar to their own. However, slowly this race died off during their interstellar travel and only one remained. The Creator. The final boss of the After Years is literally the creator of the crystals. This is an idea that probably shouldn't work, but kinda does. Final Fantasy IV was a game that let you pilot a whale spaceship and travel to the moon, so why not have the creator of the crystals be an extraterrestrial godlike being? From its battle dialogue, it doesn't appear to want to harm you, but seems to have been corrupted somehow. I read someone mentioned that this was likely the doing of Zeromus, but I didn't find any text in the game that might have implied that. In any case, the creator is defeated and the world is saved from other destruction. Each character gets their own little epilogue. Cain takes Theodore under his tutelage and they reform the Red Wings to a humanitarian group. Rydia adopts a child Maynad and raises her with the help of the people of Mist, occasionally Edge and Golbez commandeers the Lunar Whale to go and rescue Fusoya from Zeromis alone. I wish him good luck with that. According to interviews with the lead designer slash scenario writer of Final Fantasy IV, Takashi Tokita, a large majority of the original script to Final Fantasy IV had to be truncated so it could fit on a Super Nintendo cartridge. And to be honest, it shows. Several major plot points are glossed over in the original game, like Cecil and Kane's childhood, Golbez's origin story, or pretty much anything to do with Zemus. Like many games, it's one that was made on the back of compromises, but despite that, it's still praised to this very day. What might have been seen as a flaw to the original development team has almost turned into a strength, Maybe Final Fantasy IV could have used more time to develop more of its story, but if it wasn't for the limitations of the medium, we wouldn't have an RPG with very little fat. An RPG that hardly ever wastes your time and constantly keeps you on the move, introducing new things and making the adventure exciting. Tokita also said that they tried to put the greatest aspects of the first three Final Fantasies into IV, and I believe they succeeded. Tokita was also the lead designer slash scenario writer of the After Years. It's a much bigger game than its predecessor, and it doesn't take advantage of any of the benefits that might entail. The story is almost entirely devoted to either paying lip service to the original game and or ripping it off entirely. The once revolutionary gameplay has barely been touched up outside of a few superficial changes, and thanks to the episodic format, is held back from its full potential until the final hours. Many dungeons are completely unaltered from Final Fantasy IV, and on occasion you're expected to traverse through them several times. As a sequel, it completely fails to recapture the magic of the original. As a JRPG, it finds no way to separate itself from the tropes that hang around the necks of poor entries in the genre like a millstone. I should probably be more upset about it, but 
I can't muster up enough energy to be anything but let down. At least when it comes to the story, I never want to play this game again. But the plot itself I find easy to ignore in favor of treating Final Fantasy IV as the standalone entry it originally was for the first 17 years after its release. Part of it might be due to the story taking place so far removed from the original game, but I think the main reason it's easy to ignore is because everyone else ignores it. Final Fantasy IV will be talked about for years to come, whereas the After Years has had its moment in the sun all the way back when it released, and since then has only received discussions in hushed tones. Let's talk about canon. The idea of canon has always interested me. A long-running series of books, movies, games, whatever, can have a well-established continuity slash canon, but depending on the series, a bad sequel can ruin everything, whereas others just move on. Final Fantasy is a series that mostly moves on and establishes new canon with each entry, but sometimes they stick around in a specific world and build upon it with sequels and side stories. Ignoring the big example of this, let's look at Final Fantasy X. It was the first mainline Final Fantasy game to get a sequel, and I think it'd be fair to say that sequel gave people mixed feelings. Did you know, however, that there are even more entries in the Final Fantasy X canon? Did you know there was a novel where Titus accidentally kills himself by mistaking a bomb for a blitzball? Did you know this same novel featured the return of Sin? If you do know about this, it's likely because it's so unbelievably stupid, not for its quality. I'm a huge fan of Final Fantasy X, in fact I might even call it my favorite entry in the series, and I find it incredibly easy to ignore all of the supplementary material and enjoy the game on its own, and I could say the same for Final Fantasy IV. The reason for this, I believe, is because both of those games had endings that felt definitive and satisfying. Final Fantasy IV didn't need a sequel, but it got one. Unfortunately, it wasn't a good sequel. But thankfully, it does little to impact my enjoyment and love of the original, so if there's a silver lining to be found in this experience, I suppose it's that.